chapter 1. If you don't know where that is, there's a page number. Colossians chapter 1 is on page 954 in the Bible in the C pocket in front of you, or you can use the Version Bible app. While you're getting there, I want to tell you about a couple things, really just one thing. Our parking lot campaign, the Say Yes campaign for the parking lot is going swimmingly at this point. I sent a check for $40,000 to the parking lot company on Thursday, uh, which means that we have $23,000 left to go before we are done talking about the parking lot for all time. So if you're tired of it... Get your checkbook out. We can do that. But if you want to, uh, seriously, if you want to support the parking lot campaign, uh, we have these Say Yes cards at the table uh, at the back as you leave. And uh, what we were encouraging people to do was to buy a parking space for $1,500, and then uh, then we can go ahead and knock this thing out and be done with it. Okay? So, any uh, any questions about the parking lot? Good. Because I don't know anyway. All right. So, Colossians chapter 1. Uh, verse, starting in verse 15. Now, this is the second week in our series called Reclaim. And the idea behind this series is that, that Jesus has reclaimed us. Um, last week, we mentioned this one verse that said, In Him, being Jesus, we have redemption, we have the forgiveness of sin. So Jesus has cleared the way to reclaim us, to bring us back to Him, to bring us into connection and into relationship with Him. Now, even though Jesus has done everything possible to clear the way to reclaim us, to bring us back into a relationship with him, um, you know, life sometimes gets in the way, right? Some of us, maybe you're in the room and, and maybe you've lost some of your faith. Maybe you've lost your faith completely and uh, you're trying to figure out how God fits into your life or, or what God has to do with your life and the role of Jesus in your life. Um, maybe you're here today and you've totally lost your faith. Maybe you're here today and uh, maybe your faith has taken some hits. Uh, maybe you're here today and you're not even really sure about this idea of church and like, why do those people go waste their time and what's going on with all that? Uh, maybe, maybe you lost some of your faith when something tragic happened in your life or and you, you were left kind of asking like, why does God allow these things to happen? What is going on that lets God do these things? Maybe you're here today and your faith is strong, uh, but you still have some sins and some things that you struggle with. Uh, and you want to serve Jesus, uh, but you've got things that are blocking you. Uh, what we want to do, what I want to do with this series of Colossians is, is kind of open up our minds to who Jesus is and what Jesus wants to do. And I want to be super kind and super compassionate to wherever you are in your faith journey. Because I, I was at one point at, at, at a place where I didn't know about Jesus, didn't know anything about him. My life was total crap, and I could have just easily walked away, but I got introduced to Jesus and started to learn about how he cares for me and how he loves me and how he wants the best for me, and eventually gave my life to him. And so, um, it, and it, ever since I gave my life to Jesus, I want you to know, it hasn't been like this. It hasn't been like, <laughs> straight to heaven, right? That's not what goes on. You know what I mean? When we give our lives to Jesus, man, we go through struggles. We go through pains. We go through trials. And so to me, it's super important that we study God's word to see how Jesus seeks to intersect and intervene in our lives, Okay. Good? So that was my introduction. All right. Have you ever wondered who Jesus is? Now, maybe you've heard the name Jesus over and over in your life. You have some ideas about Jesus. You, you have some, maybe it's a skewed uh, sitcom theology that you have about Jesus. And he's just a guy that they laugh about on TV. And when something goes wrong, they go, Jesus Christ, I can't believe this, blah, blah, blah. Maybe that is where you are. Today, 
in Colossians chapter 1, I think we get a pretty solid answer about who Jesus is. So we're going to read uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. We're going to go verse by verse, and we're going to stop after each verse and discuss it, okay? So here we go. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. We're going to answer the question, who is Jesus? Verse 15. The Son, meaning Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Jesus is the Son of God. God being the, uh, the umbrella cover for everything and all time, Jesus is his Son. He is also, from this passage, the image of the invisible God. He is God in the flesh. So the God that we have imagined in our minds or that we read from the Old Testament and the Bible, the, the God who uh, created the heavens and the earth, he is encompassed in the flesh of Jesus when Jesus came to this earth. So everything that God is or was, that's who Jesus was when he came to this earth. He is the image of the invisible God. And that word image is translated as unspotted mirror. Okay, you ever had a you know bathroom mirror and uh, you're brushing your teeth and then something you get a little too rigorous, right? <laughs> you, I gotta get that plaque out of there, and then it comes out of your mouth and then it's like all over the mirror. You know what I mean? And you're like, I can't clean it. I don't have time. And then a month goes by and it's like you can't even see your face anymore. No, just us. Okay, well, uh, that's what I mean. So. Imagine imagine that filthy mirror and you get your Windex after it and you do it a couple times and you clean that up. That is Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the unspotted image of God, meaning he did not have sin. There was nothing wrong in him. And so he is that unspotted, perfect mirror image of God. And so what we see in the Bible about Jesus, what how he talks to people, how he cares for people, how he is compassionate for people... That is the physical attribute of a spiritual, invisible God. Now, that is a little bit heavy, right? That's a little bit heavy. But this is what we see in Jesus. Everything that we know about God from the Old Testament of the Bible, and from the New Testament, actually, we see in the physical attributes of Jesus. Everything about God is wrapped up in Jesus. John 14, 9, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is that unspotted mirror of God. Now, in verse 16, Paul goes on. Paul is the writer of this, by the way. I'll refer to him a couple times. He says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. For in him, being Jesus, all things were created. Okay, so think about that for a second. A lot of times, a lot of times, if you know a little bit about the Bible, we think that Jesus doesn't make his first appearance until the New Testament of the Bible. But this here says that Jesus was a part of the creation process. So when the world was created, when it came from darkness and nothing into what we see today, Jesus was a part of that process. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and what? For him. Him. Through him and for him. Now, we can get into microbiology and all that if you want. Everything that you can't see with the microscope, all of the stars in the universe, uh, the duck-billed platypus, the tree, a palm tree, a flamingo. Have you seen a flamingo? It looks like... Somebody got the Ikea instructions backwards <laughs> on a flamingo. You look, because you know their knees go the wrong way. What does the chair look like that a flamingo sits in? <laughs> no clue. Anyway, all of these things were created in Jesus and for Jesus. Now, I want to point something out. Because all of these things were created in him, everything comes under Jesus. He is supreme above all things. And if everything is, that has been created has been created through him and for him, then it means that he is the craftsman that is designing these things and they are for his purpose, for the thing that he decides on. Now, I want to point something out here that's going to make half of you mad and half of you happy. 
okay? He says in the passage, for in him all things were created, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. Raise your hand. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. We have the most divided country in the history of our country, politically. Now, some people will read this passage and they go, yeah, Jesus put Trump in the office. Like, definitely. And then people will go, oh, Trump's in the office. That can't be because of Jesus. Like, and that's what I'm saying. This church and our country will be split straight down the middle of that. But what I want you to know from this passage is Donald Trump is our president because of the will of Jesus. Barack Obama was our president because of the will of Jesus. Every king, every power, every ruler, every authority that has ever been in any country, in any city, in any state, in any place is because that's what Jesus wants at that time. So we have another election coming up. I don't know if you've heard. <laughs> and uh man i just can't wait for it to be over already you know uh it is hard for us sometimes to reconcile our leaders and jesus having caused that and wherever you land politically about every four or eight years you have the same kind of questions but what I want us to know and what I want us to understand is the Bible, Jesus commands us to pray for our leaders. Not to burn to sin. sin. And all of a sudden everybody's mad again. The Bible commands us to pray for our leaders. And I think the reason why we're supposed to be praying for our leaders is because Jesus put them there. Whoever they may be. For whatever reason that we may not understand, Jesus has put them there. So don't come at me with all this political nonsense because I'll slap you with the Bible. All right. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is Jesus is supreme over all things, even our political leaders. Okay? In him all things were created, heaven and earth, invisible, invisible, powers, rulers, authorities, all of it was created by Jesus and for Jesus. It is for his purpose. We are to be obedient to Jesus in all of these things. Got it? Okay. Verse 17, he, being Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things what? All things hold together. Jesus is the alpha. He is the beginning. He is the first. He is number one. Jesus is the craftsman who takes a pile of wood and turns it into a work of art. Jesus is first because Jesus supersedes creation. Because he is the creator, he is before all things, Jesus is preeminent. He says he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus is spiritual super glue, if you will. He's the cosmic bondo of our planet. He holds everything together. And those words, hold together, can be translated cohere, which means to stick or resist separation. To stick together or resist separation. So Jesus, regardless of what you think politically or where you grew up or where you've been in your life or what you've done in your life, whatever it may be, Jesus is the thing that holds us together. I know for a fact that this church is about a 50-50 split politically. Do you want to know how I know that? First of all, I've had conversations with you and I know you. But secondly, social media, right? I can see that. Like, I can see what people say there. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but your pastor is following you online. When you say accept to that, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm doing. Right? I'm big brothering you to death. But this church is split, but do you know, split politically, but do you know why we are one as a church, even though we have a different opinions about things? Because Jesus. Jesus holds us together, regardless of our political views. And we can differ in opinion about certain things, this, that, or the other, but Jesus is the one who holds us together. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Here's why, verse 18. And he is the what? He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the 
supremacy. He is the head of the body. Jesus is the head of all things because he created all things, and so he is supreme over all things. The product, I built this thing here. You're like, yeah, of course you did, because it looks like crap. <laughs> but I built this, right, just for the series. I wanted us to have something here. This is the product of my craftsmanship. Okay, you're going, come on, dude, are you bragging? Like, what's the deal? <laughs> no, this is the product of my craftsmanship. I, this is not better than me. Get that? This, this podium is not better than I am. This is a product of me as a craftsman. We are the product of Jesus, who is our craftsman. We are not better than him. He is the head. He is the one who is supreme over us, supreme over creation. He is the head of the body, the church, which is all of us. He is the head. How many of you know how to, the best way to kill a snake? If some of you snake lovers. Choke it, no. Drop its head off, exactly. Why? Why is that the best way to kill a snake? Okay, I'm hearing nothing. Because it'll just die, right? Do you cut it in the middle? If you, if you braid it, <laughs> cut it and then braid it, it can still do whatever it wants to do. Right, you cut the head off and it's done. What does the head, what does your head do for you? Everything. 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 Your head makes your heart beat. Do you know that? Like physically, your brain is the nerve center. It functions every other part of your body. It tells you when to walk, tells you when to step, tells you when to scream when you stub your toe at night. And I don't know if you know it, but your head is where your brain is at. I'm not a medical professional, but I'm pretty sure. I mean, if you chop your head off, or if you chop the head off a snake, the body doesn't know what to do. Right? The body has no idea what to do. And so Jesus is the head of the church. And if we're not submitting to Jesus, then us, the body, we have no idea what to do. Just like if your head got locked off, your body wouldn't know what to do. It would collapse onto the floor. It wouldn't even be able to stand up. And so this is why it's super important for us as a church body and as individuals to be connected to the head, Jesus, so that we know what to do and how to live in our lives. He is supreme over all of us because if we don't have a head, then we don't have a life. And so we need that. Jesus is the head supplying life and direction and motivation and purpose and operation of limbs. We need to constantly be aware of spiritual decapitation. If Jesus is our head, we need to constantly be aware of how we might be cutting him off in our life. It's very easy to lose your head. It usually happens when we allow our emotions to take over in a situation. This happened to me more than once in my life and it happened recently where I was driving and some worship song came on in my shuffle, on my iTunes or whatever. I'm like, oh yeah, that's my jam. Let's see. Mm, mm. Go! What are you doing? Just merge! And I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> and I feel like such a doofus when that happens, you know what I mean? I let my emotions take over, right? Lost complete connection with my own head and my own life, my own, and I lost connection with Jesus, and that happens a lot. <laughs> we lose connection with the head when it gets cut off. I want you to know that the head doesn't decapitate itself. You know what I'm saying? Your head doesn't just go, oh, I'm just going to fall off and you're going to be screwed. Right? And Jesus doesn't do that either. Jesus doesn't leave us, we leave Jesus. Therefore, disconnecting from the head. Verse 19 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that's Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making what? Peace. Peace 
through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus is the fullness of God in physical form. Jesus is heavenly Father God in physical form. He is the one who reconciles us back to God. He is the peacemaker. You might ask yourself, why did Jesus have to make peace? And what does that even mean? When we sin, it makes us an enemy of God. When we, when we sin, we set ourselves up in opposition of God. And so because of our sin, because we have taken an attack position against God, Jesus had to come and had to make peace. We had to be forgiven of our sin. And that's exactly what Jesus does because he makes peace through his blood that was shed on the cross so that our sins can be washed away, so that our sins can be forgiven. We cannot, we cannot be in the presence of God. We cannot go into eternity with God while still having sin attached to us. And so that's what Jesus does through the cross, through the blood shed on the cross. He washes our sin. He takes our sin away. He brings us back into connection with the head. Now, despite the fact that Jesus is all of these things, creator, reconciler, maker, lover of people, head of the body, whatever, we sometimes still wonder if he's enough. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Everything that our holy, heavenly Father God is, we see in Jesus. Going down to verse 21, moving to verse 21. This is, just, this is by the way, I want to just, as an aside, this letter is written to people who are Christians, people who have given their life to Jesus, to the church at a town at a city called Colossae. <laughs> And so he says in verse 21, once you were what? Alienated. You were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your what? Evil, Evil behavior. Right? Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. From verse 19, Jesus had to make peace because at one time we were alienated. And alienated just simply means isolated or estranged we were isolated from god we were estranged from god we were um we were stranded in a lifeboat somewhere in the ocean waiting for god to rescue us we were isolated we were estranged and we were alienated because of our evil behaviors because of our sin or we were alienated because it was shown by our evil behavior and our sin our evil behavior our choices our sin sets us up as enemies of God. We set ourselves up as enemies of God by our actions. Every single time that we sin, it is like we are launching a missile in attack at God. The stupid part about that is every, every sin missile that we launch at God in attack is a boomerang that comes back and blows up at our feet and destroys our own lives. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3 says, A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. One more time. A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. You don't have, do you know who you can blame for your actions? Your own daggone self. <clears throat> See, every time that we sin, we set ourselves up again and again and again as an enemy of God, but it really only serves to mess up our own lives. We really only have a few choices when it comes to our enemies. And if we set ourselves up as enemies against God, there's only a few things that can be done. We can either let the attacks happen, or we can fight back and destroy them, or we can make peace with them. And that is exactly what Jesus did with us. He made peace with us through his blood, even though, even though our sin sets us up as enemies and attackers of God. He goes on, once you were alienated in verse 22, but now 
And I love that, those two words in the Bible. But now, and then sometimes it says, but Jesus. Those are my favorite two words in the Bible. Because we're headed down a certain area, a certain path, a certain thing was going on in our life. But now, or but Jesus, there's been some sort of intersection and some kind of crash, maybe. But now, one, even though once you were alienated, even though once you were isolated, even though once you were estranged, now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. Okay, Jesus' physical body on the cross through death, Jesus' death. To present you what? Holy. Holy in his sight. Holy in his sight. Meaning, in this context, sin free. Without sin. Jesus died on the cross. His blood was shed on the cross so that we can be presented to God as sin free. Without sin. Without blemish. And free from accusation. But there's a caveat here. And a lot of times we don't like this. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel I would just point out a lot of times people think they can just do whatever they want and God will just oh okay I'm so bad but there's a caveat here we must continue in our faith I wonder who here is not continuing in their faith and is in danger of that. And Jesus cleared the way for us to have our sins forgiven, for us to be presented holy in God's sight. And we need to continue in that. We have been reconciled. We have been reclaimed through what Jesus did on the cross. The whole reason that Jesus went to the cross is so that he could reclaim us from sin and death to hope and life. And so we need to be aware that that's what he wants from us, to continue in our faith. To keep going with it. I would say this though. To, continuing in your faith doesn't mean you're not going to trip. Doesn't mean you're not going to stumble. Doesn't mean you're not going to fall down even. You roll down a cliff. <laughs> slide off a mountain for 150 yards. Doesn't mean that. It means that, that when that happens. That you stand back up and you say okay. I need to get reconnected to the head here. I think that sometimes we forget just how much God loves us. And so when we have those moments and those times of tripping and falling and rolling down a mountain and banging our head on a rock and whatever else is going on, we go like, oh, I can't come back. I can't go back. I can't do it. I've done so many things that are just embarrassing and wrong or whatever. Well, guess what? You are not alone. You are not alone. Jesus wants to reclaim us. He calls us his children. He wants to reclaim us. And he gives us the opportunity to be reclaimed through his blood. That happens when we say yes to baptism. When we give our lives to Jesus in baptism. It's a metaphor, right? We go under the water. We're buried. We're washed. We're raised to walk in a new life. And this is how Jesus' blood contacts us. In all of that, we must remain connected to the head, being Jesus. Now, two takeaways that I have for you this week. Really quick. And not preacher really quick, but like actually really quick. First one is this. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is absolutely worthy. Because he is supreme, because he is the head, because of who he is and what he has done, he is worthy. Of what, Wayne? Okay? Of what? 
<laughs> Jesus is worthy of your life. You can give your life to Jesus. He's worthy of that. Jesus is worthy of giving your marriage to him, submitting your marriage to him. Maybe you got problems, man. I don't know what we're going to do. Or your parenting, your kids are rotten. <laughs> and Jesus is worthy of submitting those things to your money. Oh, I don't know. That preacher's got on fancy Walmart jeans. <laughs> Jesus is worthy of your attitude. Your sacrifice. Jesus is worthy of your gratitude, your praise, your speech, your love. Jesus is worthy of your day to day. And the reason why he is supreme over all things, he is everything. He is the Alpha, the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is everything. He is the head, and we need to be connected to our head. Jesus is worthy. Second takeaway is this. You do not have to be alienated from Jesus. <clears throat> now, I, I kind of started off today, you know, I don't know where everybody is spiritually. I don't know where you're at on your walk, and I, I hope that we're the kind of church still where people um, who don't know Jesus are comfortable coming in here to go, mm -hmm. and, and I'm okay with that. Um, and in fact, in our life group this last week, we had somebody say, yeah, I don't know about any of this. And I thought, man, you're in the great, you're in the right place. Like, this is where I want you to be. But I want you to hear me say this. Wherever you are in your life, whether uh, you're just figuring this out, whether you're coming back, whether you don't know what you're doing, whether you just feel like your wheels are spinning constantly, you do not have to be alienated from Jesus. You do not have to be alienated from Jesus. Maybe you've walked away from him. I want you to hear that you can come back anytime. And you know what? To, to walk away from Jesus and then to come back, it, you don't have to throw a parade. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be a gigantic, big, huge thing. You don't even have to post about it on social media. <laughs> If you've walked away from Jesus and you want to come back to him, it is as simple as, Jesus, I'm sorry. I don't want to live like this. I screwed up. I want to give myself back to you. Or you can say it however you say it. It's that simple. It's that easy for you to come back and give yourself back to Jesus. So you do not have to be alienated from him, even though the alienation is your fault. <laughs> you don't have to do it you don't have to be there okay? I also want you to know that you can come to Jesus for the first time if you've never done that Jesus has done everything possible to reclaim you and to bring you back into his, into his presence and so if you have questions about that about giving your life to Jesus I always stand up here after service I'd love to talk to you um, I'm not going to get into all of that right now, but I would love to have those conversations. If you're ready to give yourself to Jesus for the first time, um, there's, I mean, Beacon Skiff will be there afterwards. I mean, you, go pick, you go pick apples later. All right, this is the most important thing for you to think about and consider. I want us to hear, Jesus has done everything possible to reclaim us and to keep us connected to him. And we just simply need to accept that. Um, we participate in a time of communion here every week, and I've talked a lot about the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins and all that stuff being shed uh, on the cross so that we can have that forgiveness. This time that we celebrate communion is representative of all that. The little cracker, the little cup of juice, our time in prayer there uh, helps us to come reconnect with Jesus. If you want to come back to Jesus, I tell you what, man, this, I got, there's a perfect opportunity coming like right now. For you to take the cracker and the juice and to remember what Jesus did for you on the cross and say, God, I want to come back to you. And then let him welcome you home with open arms. You guys can be dismissed.